welcome to this session on um, teaching remotely. So while I'll, whilst I have been a teacher for many years myself, a uh, teacher of mathematics, I have never faced having to teach remotely. However, luckily for you, we've got Ron Barassi here with us today, and I'd like to take a moment to introduce Ron. So hi, Ron. Hi, Shirley. Thanks for having me. That's fine. And Ron has uh, taught at Virtual School of Victoria for about 22 years. And so we thought, who better to ask um, to provide some hints and tips about how to go about teaching remotely. Some of what we'll be covering today will feel like uh, it's information you may already know, and hopefully some of it will be um, things that you maybe hadn't thought of. So, Ron, I'm just going to start by asking you just to maybe give a little bit of background on yourself and, um, and what your experience is. Okay, thank you Shirley and welcome everyone. So I started teaching at the Distance Education Centre of Victoria in 1998. It's now called the Virtual School Victoria. And back in 98, we would develop the courses and then put them in booklets and send them out to the students via post. And they would work from these booklets and complete a weekly submission sheet and then send that in again via post. And now we're in this uh, virtual world and we have our courses, all our content is in a learning management system online. And um, we also have, um, we do extensive um, video virtual lessons um, to the students every day. So things have certainly changed. Certainly, it certainly sounds quite different uh, between the start and finish of uh, what you're doing now. Um, so look, let's start right at the beginning. When teachers are preparing um, lessons to teach remotely, um, what do you think they need to do to get ready, you know, when they're preparing in advance to teach remotely? So um, first, just like, just like in a classroom, you, um, you're delivering a lesson, so you need a lesson plan which has your, your content uh, that you're going to deliver the activities and how you're going to assess the students and, and all of that. So that, that part stays the same. But also when delivering a virtual lesson, you need to have a, a screen plan. So this is sort of like a, a, it's a how you're going to lay your screen out um, and prepare for what the, what the students can see. And to do this well, you really need to know your software and there's a variety of software, but whatever it is, you need to know it well and how it works, and this will influence how you lay out your lay out your screen. So, just as just as a, an example, I've got um, a screen laid out here. So I'll just show you all my screen as I, as I would. So I'm hoping you can all see that. And so he, here's a point. So like. Um, I would show something to the students on the screen now, but I would I would like to check that they can actually see that. So I, I would say to them, can you see the screen that I'm sharing? And so they would say yes. And this is just a check, and it's okay to do that because we're all, we're all human. So up here, um, when they while the kids are coming to the lesson, so while we delayed the start of this webinar for two minutes, just to let late comers come. Um, I would be, I'd have the learning intentions um, up for, for the week, for um, what the kids are going to learn for that week. I have a video showing of me and I'd also have the participants list which I think is very important so that I know who has actually attended the lesson and also the ever important chat box. So just to point out here, on the, you, the students would only be seeing the left side of this screen from the participants chat and the video and the learning intentions here on the left side. On the right side of this screen, I would have my lesson plan. So this is always uh, front and center for me so it can keep me on track. And then down the bottom here, I often have my, my list of students. And as they, as they come in, I just enter their participation for for a given date, sorry, um, their attendance for a given date. And I also have a, a column um, on my record sheet for participation. So I just give a, uh, after, after presenting uh, the lesson, I just go through all the students that were there and I just give them a rating of one to five, you know, just to, just, just to mark the level of participation and engagement in the content that I have delivered. 
And um, Ron, you mentioned as well about um, knowing your software, knowing your platform that you're using. Um, I presume you mean like go to webinar, WebEx, that type of thing. Do you have any advice about uh, which is the best platform to use or what to look out for in using a platform? Uh, yes, so uh, I've used WebEx, GoToWebinar and Adobe Connect and they're all different and they all have different uh, features. But the, the, so there's, there's a few features which are, you really want, um, you really want to have whatever software you're using. And um, first and foremost is the ability to share your screen. So that is, that is number one. And also it's really nice if you can, uh, if the software also allows you, allows the participant to share, share their screen. Um, and so the presenter has, has the control over that and can just click on a participant, a student, and that gives the ability for that student to share their screen if they've made a creation, you know, or, or something. What's, you know, so that's, that's a really good thing. Um, also having a tool called a polling tool where you can ask a question in real time um, and, and the students answer and you can see the results in real, to, uh, real time. That's a, a quite a good engagement factor uh, for the students and increases participation. Um, another great tool to have is a, a whiteboard. So uh, if at home you happen to have a tablet and a stylus, that's, that's ideal. So you can write on, on your tablet and it appears on the screen because you're sharing, sharing the whiteboard or sharing your screen. So really that's, uh, that's a bit like being back, black, back in the classroom with your whiteboard or your blackboard. So that's kind of a comforting, a comforting tool to have. Um, when playing videos back, some software, um, you have some variation here. Ideally, you want, if you play a video on your screen and you're sharing that, that the students can, can hear the audio from that video. Other, other videos, other, other software you, that you can play the video, but they, you can't hear the sound necessarily. So um, te technically, that becomes a little more fraught. Um, Another great thing is to have the ability to see when a student raises their hand. So this is um, an icon maybe beside the name of each participant, and if they if they if they want to speak, they they raise their hand. Uh, so that's really good. Um, and also being able to privately send a message to one of the students because. You're mainly working through the through the uh, chat box, and things can be said that sort of like maybe in a, maybe inappropriate. So you might like to uh, send them a message, but you don't want to do it in in front of the whole class. So just being able to send a message to a single student at a, at any given point in time is also a really handy feature. That's great. And you mentioned before, Ron, about um, the setup of your screen that a student can see. And I know the previous screen you showed, um, the student bit was on the left and then you had some information on the right that was just that you could see. So can we talk a little bit more about how to set up a screen that students will see and what that could potentially look like? Okay, so this is, this is part of your um, screen layout plan and it takes some time uh, you need some time before the lesson to have this set up. So um, you can have um, full presentation mode. It's just, just a single screen, a single file, maybe a PowerPoint present, presentation showing, or you might have a half screen where, say, for example, you might have a, a question on one side and um, a whiteboard on the other, so that's taking up half the screen each. Or you might even like to go a little bit further and say use half the screen and a quarter of the screen for another file or image and then down below a, another file. It just depends on the content that you are going to deliver. So just as an example, um, I'll just show you a screen that I set up that is really like um, the screen that I would set up for this lesson. So this is just a setup. I'm using the half quarter quarter screen here and the lesson is uh, Year 7 Mathematics and they're doing transformation. So on the left here, um, this, is, this, is, 
this is what I would show at the beginning uh, to let the kids let the kids know uh, what is coming and what some of the content might be. And so I've got the learning intentions clear, how we communicate communicate in the classroom, which is also front and centre. And these are these are sort of rules, just like you have rules of behaviour in the classroom, you have rules of behaviour online as well. Uh, and also um, the assessment for for the week. So that's that would say I just show this on the left. I'd be talking, and at this point, uh, you've still got kids who are just arriving. They've arrived late, and usually I, I wouldn't start. I'd have this screen showing maybe after like two, two or three minutes, and but I'd still be waiting for late you know latecomers to arrive, and it just shows them that there's a, a video going to be coming, and also an inter an interactive. So. That's that's sort of how I would begin my begin my okay. lesson. And just before we do talk about delivering a lesson, um, Ron, I might just ask about um, just as students come into the class or join the class or the tutorial or whatever, um, how do you set them up? So, for example, are they on video? Are they muted? Are they, you know, what's that situation? Okay, so. Um, at the virtual school, um, especially the younger kids, um, most of them don't want to have their mic on at all, or their videos. So all communication occurs via chat. I have had the experience of letting the kids have their videos and mics on, and um, I did that once, and I, I won't do that again. <laughs> so that's a, like a, a word of warning there, because if a, if a student has got their video on, they're in their bedroom, they've got brothers and sisters, mums and dads passing by, it's very distracting. Uh, also having having the mic on is also creates a lot of background noise and feedback, all these sort of um, technical problems can happen. So it's best just to have them both off and all the communication coming via chat. Um, also, I have a have a role where I take it, take attendance. If you if you can't have it on the screen, just do pen and paper. Um, but what's really important in the beginning, I feel, is that when it's when a student arrives, I I acknowledge them in the chat box, like I'll say hello, Shirley, um, but also also say that um, over the mic, so that they know that I can see them and that they're welcome, and this is this is a place where they they're going to learn. Um, one more thing, it's really important that each student logs on with their real name. Okay, so you actually know who is uh, who is typing what in the chat box. Okay, that sounds like good advice too. Um, and look, let's go back to just that um, delivering the lesson. So you had your screen up before and um, I was just wondering about, you know, what have you found has worked the best? Is it, you know, lecture style, tutorial style? Obviously, it's very different to being in a classroom where you're physically all together, but I imagine there must be some similarities. But um, how do you deliver a lesson? So, well, um, again, um, it really um, depends on what you're delivering, one, um, and two, uh, which year level you are delivering to. So on that, on that second point, uh, a lecture style presentation where you're going to be talking for like uh, 20 to 30 minutes um, it's going to be that's going to be difficult for young students it might be more appropriate for you know year 11 and 12 students so <clears throat> that's something you have to you have to consider if I, I teach year 7 digital technology at the moment and so if I was going to do be in lecture style mode I might um, only plan to go for maybe 10 15 minutes and then I would break into some sort of activity where the students are actually participating online. So, and um, what the sort of activities that I would, would um, engage in with Year 7 kids are ones that are interactive. So either I'm using an interactive to demonstrate um, or I'll give the kids a link to um, an interactive and so they have it on their own screen at home and they can explore that interactive while while I'm doing a demonstration. So that's that's um, a couple of ways of doing it. A third way that is really useful, but you would set it up a little bit differently, is you might alert your students um, via email that you're going to have your room open between say one and three to do any um, any help with any any sort of questions. So that might be not. Um, it's not compulsory, it's an optional thing, you might set it, set it as optional, 
and kids come in and do their um, ask if you're having trouble with a maths question and they come in and you just help help that single student at that time uh, with, their, with their problem and you keep the room open and then five minutes later another student pops in. But you stick to those times between one and three. So there, there's some sort of like variations on how you can actually do it. And do you have um, an example of maybe some interaction to show us or? Um, yes, and yep. Right. Yes, yeah, Shirley. So I'll I'll just um, go back to my screen again. Um, the lesson that I've set up here. So here we are, and let's just say all the kids have arrived, and I'm about to I'm about to start, and I'll say, well, okay, let's let's just get into this. And so here we go. No way. Are you kidding me? Are you telling me you could have been a Camaro this whole time? So I would, um, this is just sort of like a, uh, a, an engagement uh, tool that I would use. I, I would, I'm talking about transformations in mathematics. So I'm not sure that every kid would know what um, to transform means. So using something that they already know and is anchored in their mind, then we could discuss the movie for, you know, for um, a minute or two, kids will want to do that. Then you can start to get down to, you know, the more sophisticated understanding of the word transform, what happened to the, to, uh, the transformer then turned into a car, it changed. So that's the sort of engagement factor that I would start with uh, in the beginning. And then after doing that, then I'd um, say, right, now we're going to look at transformation of shapes in mathematics. And so I would bring up this uh, interactive, which comes from Jacaranda's um, Learn On platform, and it's an introduction to transformation. So I would send the kids a link to this interactive um, so that they all have it on their screen, in this case, uh, at, and they can explore it. And as I would go through um, explaining certain things, so I might like to want to want to demonstrate what a rotation looks like. So this is how this one, this interactive works. So you've got to know your interactive, and then we would discuss what actually changed and what points changed there, and the lesson would continue and carry on like that all the time. I have to monitor the chat box. Yeah, and so I, I imagine then that that level of interactivity is to just, um, in the absence of being able to sort of explain everything on a on a board uh, like you might easily do in a classroom, um, or through um, screens where you can see everybody um, in right in front of you, that that would help to keep students engaged. So look, um, I'm just wondering. So that just reminds me about homework. So when you are setting assignments or homework or um, uh, things that you want students to do between the sessions where you've seen them, either as a tutorial or a lesson. How do you handle homework and assignments? Okay, so at the at the virtual school, um, we've got all our courses online, and just using um, the course that I'm responsible for, digital technology. So it's it's got enough content for the students to do three hours of work during the week, and that's all that's all clearly laid out online, and also. They have a document, a Word document that they can download um, at the beginning of the week, and and as they work through the lessons, they can complete this document. And the document contains a um, smattering of tasks from the entire week's work. Now, why 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 a smattering? Because if you've got all these all these kids doing all this work, and you want to see work from uh, from every student, from every lesson, uh, you will soon be extremely overwhelmed with the amount of uh, emails and correction that you that you have to do. So it's you, it's something that re that really needs to be managed. And so they send in one file once a week, and and this is what I correct. What I correct. Um, part of one of the difficulties of teaching virtually is that you simply cannot have 
uh, cannot see what, how the kids are going as often as you're, you, you're used to. It's something that you, that you need to accept. The more you can't accept it, the more you're going to want to see their work and the more correction that you're going to have to do and your emails will just will pile up. So you've got to work out a way of managing what you're going to get from the students, but you want to keep it nice and um, nice and tight and manageable. So there are there are ways out there, there are um, platforms out there that are really useful. And um, two that I know of, one is Jacaranda's platform, where if you've got your class enrolled in the platform, um, the one that I use in digital technology is code.org. So the whole, all, the, all the students are in there and they're doing work that is available on, on the platform. And the beauty about these platforms is like if, you, if kids are, then do questions on transformations, I can then at a later date after the lesson, I can go in and, and click on a kid's name and see all the questions that they've answered, which ones they've got wrong, and I can instantly know where their strengths and weaknesses are. So this is, they're, they're, they are wonderful tools and they really um, help you to efficiently manage all the assessment and um, feedback that you want to give you want to give to students. They actually take a lot of the work away from you because a lot of these um, tasks are assessed by the, by the platform itself. So um, yeah, it's really something you have to think about. You have to think about a strategy of how you're going to manage this. But um, key point is you can't see as much as, as what you're used to. So if you can use a platform like Jacarandas, that's fantastic. Um, Code.org is also fantastic. And it's, yeah. So just be careful with that and how you do that. And, and I noticed in, in, on the PowerPoint slide there um, that you mentioned about emailing files and file management. I just might get you to talk to that for a second, uh, Ron. Okay, so uh, with um, you know, 30 kids in a, uh, in a class that you're responsible for, and maybe you've got two classes, and so maybe you've got a year eight maths and year seven digital technology, and you get kids sending in uh, a file and it's called week one. Now, this is, this is a problem for you and it's also a problem for the student because they will have a whole lot of files called week one, one for maths and one for Digitech. So I, at the beginning, um, at the beginning of, of the year, I tell them how I would like their, them to structure each, uh, each file that they send in for each week. So, I use a student ID um, followed by a, their name, followed by the subject name, followed by the week. So um, I don't know if my, anyway, so this week that we were doing transformations on, it's called week C3. So it keeps every file um, easily and easily identifiable and unique. So this is very important. It's, it's not too hard, though I have to say, um, Still at the um, at the end of uh, six months, you've got your seven kids who can't name their file correctly. Okay, yeah, but yeah, imagine. you've got to give them tips. Okay, I for doing imagine. that. And um, that just uh, reminds me: Do you uh, record the lessons, and do you make the recordings available to students? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, all all lessons that I I do are recorded, and I make them available. Um, Online uh, as soon as I can after the lesson. So in the in the in in any course, there's a place where um, the students know that the recordings will be. Because some kids will um, won't be able to make the lesson. In our case, we have some kids overseas, so they can actually never make it. So they watch the recordings, and all I do is basically um, I hit record uh, in whatever software I'm doing, and then I go to I I either download the file or I grab a link and I put that in a place where the students the students know they are going to um, be able to access it. And as far as making it um, nice and doing um, video editing, well, if, you, if you're a whiz at that, um, go for it. But if, if like most of us, um, you only know how to, to, to um, do a few minor things, well, all I do is basically, I usually chop off the end and, and the beginning and that's pretty, that's pretty quick. And any, anything more than that um, can quickly become re really time consuming. 
but yes, yeah. all kids, all kids have all all lessons are recorded so they can view them in their own time as well. That's great advice. And so, look, because um, I want to leave plenty of time for questions, because we've got a lot of people online, and I can see a lot of questions coming in. So I want to leave um, some time for questions. So, just uh, Ron, any final tips? So, what what would be your top tips? So, teachers are going out there next week; they're going to have to teach remotely uh, in many cases. Um, and so, what would be your your top final tips? Okay, so. Um as I said earlier, it's really important that they use their real name. I'd actually make that a, uh, a rule of the class. They use their real name when they log on so that you know who uh, it, uh, you're communicating with. And also laying the ground rules out um, for the behaviour in the classroom as you would in a, in a face to face situation is, is very important. Um, so respect and, and niceness is uh, really valuable. Uh, really important that they use the chat box, chat box wisely, and um, they don't they don't spam it. So keeping tabs on that, like a lot of kids will type in, "I've just got to go right now." And again, it's another entry. The chat box is always moving all the time. Keeping that to a minimum um, is is wise. And another thing is um, do do what you can to get the students to participate so and if you can think of ways of using the actual software um, like the chat box so uh, an example there um, was I, I did a lesson on binary binary numbers and um, the code for the letters on of the alphabet and it was all in binary so we decided that we spent um, 10 minutes using the chat box to communicate only with ones and zeros and the kids, the kids loved it. And this is just using, uh, you, can't, you, you can't really do that in the classroom easily, but you could do it easily with this virtual software. So anything like that is, is great. But basically overall, the ground rules are really similar. Um, you wanna have a safe and respectful learning environment for all the students and for yourself. And I noticed that you've added there um, not to be afraid to ask the students for help if you're struggling with the technology as well, which is always a good tip, I reckon. Look, thanks very much, Ron. That's been fantastic. And um, hopefully everyone who's uh, on this call has uh, just gotten something out of that, even if it's just one little tip, something you hadn't thought about, how to you know, manage files or how to manage a screen or um, et cetera. Um, so look, I'm just going to um, mention a couple of little things. We're about to take uh, the questions. So Adair is going to come online in a second and, and uh, ask the questions. Um, if you haven't yet added your question to the chat box, now's your chance, although we've got quite a few there already. Um, uh, I just want to say here at Jacaranda, we we really want to help you, and this this webinar is just a step in that, and hopefully it has been some help. Um, but we have all sorts of ways that we're happy to help teachers, and um, your first point of contact really is the consultant for your area. You don't have to remember everybody's name from this slide, but if you go onto our Jacaranda website, you will find the consultant for your area. They will be happy to talk you through um, you know, what resources we've got available, etc. We've got a couple of special sort of um, things that we're offering in term two. And so one of those is if you're not using us already for, um, but you'd like additional resources, be they uh, online courses or PDFs or anything else uh, in any of our subjects, seven to 12, and we have um, subjects across all, uh, sorry, we have titles across all subject areas pretty much. Um, but if you would like materials and you just need to get your hands on them, we're offering them for free for term two. Uh, so please, uh, if you want to organize access, just take yes on your survey and we'll follow up with you within the next couple of days and um, if you are already using Jacaranda but you think Do you know what I haven't really uh, got my head fully around how to use learn on yet which is our online course and um, but everybody who uses Jacaranda has that course already you don't have to do anything to get it uh, so if you um, just don't quite know how to go about doing it you know setting up your classes etc to have online access uh, there's an action plan available at the, the on our Jacaranda website you'll find it and um, and also we've got a 
couple of webinars coming up. One is um, really from me, next uh, running an on-demand uh, webinar, which is one you don't have to sign up for. We're just going to send it out to everybody who's, exist who's an existing user of Jacaranda Resources. We'll send that out um, next week. And it's how to use Learn On for remote teaching, how to use that online course, no matter what the subject is. Um, but you might also be interested in a webinar we've got coming up in May. On May the 6th, this is one that you would need to register for. Um, Michael Cargreg is, um, Dr. Michael Cargreg is, uh, I'm sure everybody knows, is a leading psychologist um, in Australia. Um, and he's running a webinar on supporting student well-being during this time. Um, we've only got a thousand places for that um, webinar. It will be live and uh, it will not be recorded, just, just to let you know. So please watch out for that if you think that will be helpful to you. And we know that students will be quite stressed at this time. Or if you can think of another way that Jacaranda can help you that we haven't thought about because it's new to us as well, all of this, then you should let us know. Um, but I think on that note, let's go across Adair to um, the questions and welcome Adair. Great. Thank you, Shirley and Ron, for that. That was an excellent um, presentation. Um, so we do have nearly 600 teachers in this session. So as you can imagine, we've got a lot of questions coming through. So I apologise in advance if we don't get to your question, um, but you will have the opportunity to leave it in the survey at the end. Um, so that survey will pop up automatically after the end of this webinar um, in a browser. So just make sure you don't click out of that and you leave your question there. Um, so I do have a few questions that popped up a few times. Um, one of them is, how do you run formal tests and how do you authenticate students' work? Okay, so um, at, at the uh, virtual school, uh, all, our, all of our kids are, are everywhere and so they're often in different time zones. So if we're going to run a test, um, say for example in Year 10 Mathematics, the test is sent out on a certain date and they have maybe within a whole week to complete the test. But all, all students at the virtual school have a supervisor. So let's say parent or guardian or maybe a member of uh, a school, if we have a school student doing, it, doing the subject there. And so the test is sent out with a supervisor certificate uh, and they have to sign it that um, the conditions of the test were adhered to. And while the student is doing the test, um, they are they are just they are supervising, so it's under test conditions. Um, but there is we don't have a situation where all kids are required to do it exactly at the same time. It's just not not possible for us uh, in our present circumstances. So there is an element of trust there. And Adair, I might just add to that for Jacaranda products. So if someone is using our Learn On platform, um, the teacher will be able to set formal assignments uh, with questions from a pool that students don't have access to across all subjects. So English, history, geography, etc., math, science. Um, so teachers will be able to set uh, assignments virtually in, in the online course. They'll be able to set a start and finish time um, and the, the system will automatically um, uh, submit the, the assessment at the end of that finish time so that teachers can control that. Um, and of course, uh, the tests would be individualized to the students. So in other words, the students, the ability to, you know, uh, if it's formal assessment, the ability to cheat is, is um, lowered if that's important to the teacher. So um, we just encourage if you have a Jacaranda product and uh, you therefore will have access to learn on, we encourage you to take a look there if you haven't done so before. Great, thank you. Um, another question here is, do you follow a set timetable, for example, maths period one, English period two, or do you follow a different structure? Some people have mentioned doing catch-ups over a period of time. What? How do you handle that? Um, at the virtual school, uh, uh, in year eight and uh, year nine, this is this is sort of like a trial. Um, we've got students. Students have a specific timetable, and yes, they have maths at nine o'clock and science at ten o'clock, etc. Et um, but and that's and those they the students have to attend those lessons uh, in. In other subjects, other year levels, the teachers are running usually um, one lesson uh, each week on the, on the content for that subject for that week. 
um, it is, it is a time is designated. So it's always the same time. So in Digitech, I always do uh, my lesson for the week at 11.30 on a Monday. And the kids always know that. Uh, but it's not the same sort of timetable as in, in, in a school. And so I, I think uh, an important point here, I, I don't know how schools are necessarily going to manage it and do it themselves, but if you are having kids do maths at nine and science at 10 and English at 11, et cetera, et cetera, then you're also asking, I want teachers to be aware that you're asking students to now sit in front of a computer for three or four or five hours a day. And that is going to be a, a hard ask for them and also, also for the teachers. So it's just something to be mindful of um, how you would do it. Great. Um, so we have a few other questions. I think you might have mentioned it in your presentation. Um, but what platforms do you use? Um, so for assessment, learning and um, video sharing and stuff like that. Um, and have you used Zoom before? That popped up um, a few times from a few people. Um, at the at the virtual, virtual school uh, last year, we used Adobe Connect, but this year um, we have to use WebEx. So we all went on a steep learning curve at the beginning of the year. And um, have we used Zoom? No, the whole school has to use WebEx. Mm -hmm. um, have I used Zoom? Yes, I have. Um, are the features are the features the same? I'm not really sure, so because I, I haven't explored uh, Zoom that much. But it, it, it is um, WebEx is the um, platform that the department suggests or mandates us to use currently. Great, thank you. Um, so another one here. Do you have any tools that help students to collaborate online? Um, collabor the, the collaboration online, uh, I have always found uh, difficult. The, the, the best the best tools that I've, I've used have been um, Google, Google Sheets and Google Docs because the interaction between the students uh, appears, uh, the changes are live. So that is, that is really useful. I know there are other tools out there uh, to, to help with collaborative work, but I, at this point, um, I haven't actually used very many of them at all apart from those two. And so Adair, I might just mention for anyone again who's using Jacaranda products already, um, or in fact you'd like access to them, uh, within all of our subjects uh, at 7 to 10 we have a feature called Projects Plus, um, and this was designed, it's designed actually for both our Learn On platform and for our ebook platform, um, and it's a product that's, um, it's just, it's project based, but it's, um, it allows group work on that Projects Plus platform, so you just link straight, straight through to, to it from the ebook or from Learn On, and it allows students and the teacher to be in groups, and then the groups work together on on projects, um, and each uh, student's contribution is seen and uh, recorded and shared, and and they all work towards. Um, the uh, investigational project and we've got that available in all of our subjects so um, English and maths and science and history and geography etc and um, so just if people are um, looking for something to collaborate then um, I encourage them to take a look at those um, so not only are they very good projects but very good opportunities to collaborate. Great thank you um, we probably have time for two or three more questions um, so we had a few people asking about issues around privacy, about recording um, teachers and also rec recording students. Is this an issue that you've run into at virtual school? Uh, at, the, at the virtual school, we, uh, students are asked whether to <clears throat> um, sign a form to give permission to, to share work. Mm -hmm. um, all, all lessons are delivered within the confines of the school, so we, we don't really have any um, privacy issues there. What exactly happens next term, uh, unsure about, given that uh, lessons will be, need to be delivered from the teacher's home. So that's currently, um, yeah, it's an interesting point, and I don't know the answer to that at present. Great, thank you. Um... So another one here, uh, how do you split your screen ready for sharing and do you use two screens? So maybe you could take control and just show teachers how to um, format 
a few different. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So um, I'll just um, share my screen again. So here we have. Let's. I'm just going to bring up another document. So this is. I'm on a Windows system. Um, I, 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 ideal. It's best if you if you can have two screens, but not all of you will. So it's just something you've got to practice beforehand. But one really cool feature that Windows has is in setting up your screen is you can drag the window and hit it on the left or the right. This doesn't. There we go. And it's depending on where you drop it, it will. Sh it, it's or automatically taking up here a quarter of the screen. And if I did the same with this one, there's now it's a quarter of the screen. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what happened then. <laughs> and this will happen in your class. So anyway, just bring that up. Okay, but also uh, just knowing that you can change the size of your window here and move it around to fit exactly where you might want something to fit is is really cool. And this little button up here gives you free free access of the size of the window. So you might like to set it up like this. Again, this takes time, so you just need a little bit of prep. But there we go. That's a completely different setup. Just by dragging the corners of your window in Windows, banging it against the side of your monitor. Um, this gives you half and quarter size fits. So that's just a, a little trick that you can use. Great, thank you. So we might just have one more um, as I'm conscious of time. Um, what's the best way to keep your students engaged while they're learning online? Uh, ideally, I would say um, having some sort of interactivity. So my, my, favorite, my favorite way, if you can, uh, depending on your subject, a way where where the students are interacting with some material from a website and they are creating something <clears throat> excuse me so uh, for example uh, I go to code.org and I go to the um, app lab there and we do coding and I might be explaining some some syntax in the code and how it works and they are also on a same screen but it's their screen and they can create whatever code they want and I might put up an example of some code and it might draw a nice artistic mathematical picture and I give them tips on how they can change that and then they're doing the same thing uh, at home and they're creating, they're creating their own art with code and then I ask them if they would like to share and so they can just send me the link of their creation, I'll pop that straight in the chat box and then everyone can see everyone else's creations so and and the kids the, the students the students love that they 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 really do so the more interactive it is the more little activities you've got um uh it's really useful and also yeah just just make sure though that the students are also also um having a break sometimes and getting out of their seat and moving around a little bit um at a point where you're not teaching um, but yes, interactivity uh, and videos, videos are really good, but make sure you've seen them all before so you know what's coming. <laughs> it's really important. Great. That's a great tip. Thank you so much. So that's all the time we have for questions. Um, well, look, thank you, everybody. Um, it's been terrific to have you on board today. And um, we look forward to your questions. Uh, we look forward to your suggestions and your feedback. Um, and I'd like to thank you, Ron, as well. Um, it's been terrific. Thank so you, thanks so much. And, um, and um, everyone stay safe and good luck with uh, term two. So thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.